Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. And this week, we have the first part of a two-parter, because back in February, when we were at the Pima Air and Space Museum, the boss, Scott Marchand, set up a little road trip for us, and we headed up to the fantastic Goshawk Unlimited in Casa Grande, Arizona, which is in between Tucson and Phoenix. Why did we head up there? Well, Dave and Lindsay Goss do incredible things. They build FW-190s there. And as we're going to see with the F-8 they have in the shop, they do phenomenal work. And they're going to show us around. They're going to tell us a little bit about how they got into it, Lindsay growing up around fighters, and what they do now. Next week, we get to crawl around the consolidated privateer that they look after, which is the last airworthy privateer in the world. So we've sort of split this up into two places. And the reasons why, you'll see, because it's just a fantastic tour, and it will be great to spend specific time with what's inside and the big beast that's outside. And I can't thank Scott and the team at the Pima Air and Space Museum enough, A, for sponsoring the show, and B, for heading up there with me and Scott for holding the camera and being a very good cameraman, except for the one or two times <laughs> that he wasn't. But we won't hold that against him. Pima is an amazing place and I am very proud to be sponsored by them and to work with them on many of these videos. So please do, if you can't get out to Arizona, check out the website just to see the incredible things that they have going on there at the moment and the collection, which is ever growing more aircraft coming out of the restoration hangar as well. So please do head over to pimaair.org to check them out. But we have Goshawk Unlimited to chat to, and this is really, really good fun. And chatting to Dave and Lindsay about, in this case, rebuilding possibly the classic German fighter of World War II. Some may see the best all round fighter of the Second World War, and I have, despite wearing a Hawker Siddeley t-shirt, a big soft spot for Kurt Tank's FW-190. So let's delve in and find out where the Goshawk Unlimited story began. So thank you so much for having me down. This is very kind of you, and let me crawl over your fabulous aircraft here in the shop. But I really want to start by talking about you guys and how Goshawk came your project and passion for a long time. Now. Long time. Yeah. Well, my dad was a bombardier navigator on B-17s, retired out of the Air Force uh, as a navigator on C-130s, which mm -hmm. C-130s happened to be my favorite airplane. Shouldn't say that around all these fighters, but... Um, the, Her the Hertz are a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah. yeah. I came out here to go to ASU. I think I was in my third year of engineering technology, and I saw, I didn't know warbirds existed. I never, you know, I'd already been in aviation for a while, but I never realized warbirds exist. I saw this B-17 sentimental journey in Mesa. Yeah. And uh, what is that? And then my, I joined them, and then my class load started getting reduced and then I was offered a job at the Champlin Fighter Museum okay in April of 1983 so not too long ago then not too long ago and it was absolutely the best decision I ever made yeah. I really didn't want to be in school and it was that's why I remember April 1983 mm -hmm. and from there when did you decide to set out and set up your own shop well I think I never I never, uh, well, for one thing, having your own shop, your own business is pure insanity. It never, <laughs> it never leaves you, as we talk about it. It stays with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But I, uh, I never envisioned myself having our own business. Mm -hmm. And I think I worked uh, for Doug Champlin for 12 years, and then he was a customer for 18 years. Um, when they closed the museum, he had actually said, Dave, it's time to start your own business. 
I already had a project on the side. I was already collecting tools, and he let me run the shop as if it was my own business. Mm -hmm. um, so I almost had OJT you know, job, yeah. on the job training on him, <laughs> and that's what he wanted. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the first month in business, I had one employee. He was paid, light bills paid, rent paid, and I had $11 in the bank. And I was not paid. <laughs> and my wife was, Dave. And I said, I told you, this isn't going to be easy. And anyway, it's, it, that's where it started. It kind of went from there. We've never looked back, and I've never regretted the decision to go into vintage aviation and really the decision to be our own our own boss yeah um if things are right it's to our credit that w that Lindsay and i have the right people mm -hmm. if things go wrong it's my fault period no okay. excuses and uh i'd like to blame her but i can't <laughs> well let's ask Lindsay if you want to hand hand her the microphone as this is going to be Handing me, being handed back and forth quite a few times, I think. How did you get roped into this? Was this inevitable that you joined the family firm? Uh, I'd say it was a bit inevitable. Um, I had the pleasure of growing up in the shop and <laughs> growing up in the, um, the museum. Sorry if I get a little emotional. It's, it's right. kind of nostalgic for me to think about my childhood and just the experiences that I got to have were pretty amazing and things that I'd like to be able to give to my daughter but just growing up in the museum and the shop it was almost like you know my playground being able to go from the world war one hanger to up to the gift shop and visit with the ladies and over to the World War II hangar, and I just, I really enjoyed working with my dad in the shop. Mm -hmm. That was the fun part. The office work was this sort of it's less fun side. necessary, but yeah, it's not, it's not as fun, I think, Scott has said, as you move up, <laughs> yeah. the fun stuff goes down. Yeah. And I've come to learn that in the last several years, but... I enjoy working with my dad. Watching the planes fly is probably, it shows me the payoff. Yeah. It makes it all worth it. Yeah. yeah. Especially getting to walk out and stand by the runway when the privateer takes off or when the Mustang takes off and you can just feel it and hear it. It's And when I don't have to have a camera in my hands and I can just enjoy the moment. Yeah. But yeah, I feel it was a bit inevitable growing up in the shop. I think she was packing wheel bearings when she was seven years old. <laughs> and I mean, packing them, grease all over hands. I mean, she she did everything when she was little. She grew up in the shop. She grew up in the shop, so when it was inevitable. And I would say probably my happiest time because there was. Uh, having any business, there is, there is, it's, it's no, it's not happy. It's, you know, it can be rewarding, but it, the happiness doesn't seem to stay there. There are ups and downs. I think is what people usually say, isn't it? But so, looking around the shop, as we shall move on from reminiscing, because let's talk about the airplanes. Because you, you're going to make me emotional in a minute as well. <laughs> Um, not that I'd ever get my daughter into business analysis, because that's terrible. We don't we don't get to play with things like this. Hey, it might be fun for her. <laughs> like I said, this crazy person wants to be a doctor, which I wanted to get out of school as quickly as possible. She's got five more years of it. Yeah, hey, I went off and did my own thing for a while and circled back around, yeah. so. Get drawn back into it. Yeah. yeah. So the thing that, you know, I... I was really excited to, to come up and see was a privateer, which is sat outside. And I, you know, he says quietly unzipping his T-shirt with the consolidated logo on it. That's fantastic. We're going to get to that. But the work you guys do in here is very varied, isn't it? So we've got FW190s, which are probably what everybody's hearing about you guys doing at the moment. But 
what are some of the aircraft that you've had come through the shop over the last the last while? In the last while, I mean, being 30 or 40, 40 years of this, it's, I mean, it's, you know, we don't, we do seem to now have specialized in um, Focke Wolf 190s, mm -hmm. but there was a time when I got tired of P-51s, <laughs> and then it went from P-51s to T-28s. Uh, I like the variety, because it's not everything, the same thing every day. Mm -hmm which also can be hard, uh, especially the foreign. You know, the parts aren't available, the drawings aren't available, having to translate everything. But I mean, we've had Fock Wolves, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it, we've had trainers, we've had bombers, like you said, the privateer. Uh, we, we're now doing a wing, as you'll see, uh, for the Yanks Museum, uh, rebuilding their P-47 wing. Mm -hmm. And then um, we just, we had a Fairchild 24 project. We, we did stop the project, but I mean, we've had Super Cubs, uh, L5s, T6s. Um, I'm sure there's things I've forgotten because we, we, we've been able to do a little bit of everything. We've been, we did a, a wing repair on a B-17 with uh, Gene Packard's business at Mason mm -hmm. before we came here. Uh, and being that my dad was the bombardier on a B-17, was it was very unique. I mean, I really enjoyed that. The hangar is actually built dimensionally to have a B-17. Uh, so is that the dream project then? Actually, the dream project now is a Vietnam era C-130 gunship. <laughs> and in this country, you can never say never. Yes. But, I think the B-17 would be the dream project. Uh, we had a customer for a while that might have done a JU-88 project. Ooh. And I thought, the only one in the world, nobody knows what it is, and it flies over the hangar. Which, what would cause you the most surprise? And it would, be, would have been the JU-88. A loss of surprise and probably a loss of headaches for you two. I, yes, I think so. <laughs> I mean, even even the, um, the Focke-Wolf, we, we have potentially have a client that wants a long nose and a short nose. Mm -hmm. And I figured the one we have just completed for Collins was, I've told Lindsay and the guys, for years, this will be the last one, this will be the last one. You know, mm -hmm. it'll, they're just, the projects don't exist, and then wham, mm -hmm. there's one of each. And it's, it's you know, I can't, when, when we do something, I'm not looking at what am I going to, I've had customers, well, what are you going to paint it? Mm -hmm. And we don't even have the wing built. And I'm going, I haven't even considered that. I haven't even considered the paint scheme. I'm trying to get one component done at a time. Yeah. Um, and so these, these projects, they're intimidating, but um, they're rewarding when they're done. Because so far we've done things that nobody else has done. And it, it's not a... I'm not saying that as a bragging, but um, I've I have family history with the, the Fock Wolf. My dad was shot down on his first mission in the B-17 by a Fock Wolf. Mm -hmm. My uncle was shot down in a Spitfire on his first mission by a Fock Wolf, and both my dad and my uncle were POWs for the whole war. So here we are restoring Fock Wolves, and, and I actually love my family. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lindsay was very kindly showing me this one that's behind us so I'm, I'm gonna put her on the spot and ask her about it what's what's the deal because the detail what's the deal when I should say the detail that you guys have put into this aircraft is phenomenal right down to what you put on the skins it's how do you go about figuring out how to recreate one of these aircraft uh, lots of research uh, fortunately, we had started some of the research back when we did the D-13 for Doug Champlin, which I believe we completed in 2004. Mm -hmm. So we did have uh, the, the previous experience, which was very helpful. My dad had finished the, finished the Paul Allen project. Yep. So a bit of experience from that too, but they're 
want to say over 55,000 man hours have been put into this aircraft from the research to the hand forming of the parts. Um, our team was just very dedicated to finding the details to make her original mm -hmm. and and it, it's it's I keep saying it it's stunning and having been fortunate to get up close with a few aircraft you, you start noticing how sympathetic a restoration can can be and sometimes how unsympathetic it can be and it's it, it's just absolutely beautifully beautifully done I guess for for you guys it's it's a sort of mark of pride to make sure that it's just the way it should be, but also what the customer's after as well. Is it, does that sometimes conflict between what you know it should be and maybe what the customer is, is after? Maybe there's a bit of conflict, but we've been very fortunate to work with customers who are good people. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of, that really helps a lot. Yep. Um, we never compromise on safety. That is not, that's non-negotiable. Um, we're not going to do work that we wouldn't be proud of. Yeah. And so I suppose we just don't work with customers that align with those wishes so i guess there can be a bit of conflict yeah i think on this on this project there really started out with no conflict mm -hmm. because rob collins said he wanted the airplane restored 100 percent yep and the very first thing i asked him is do you know what you you're saying when you say 100 mm percent -hmm. that's not 99 percent and he's he has said over the years that that's come back to haunt him several times <laughs> but he never told me anything that he didn't want done because of expense he he wanted it to be the best and each pro Bockwolf project for us has been better and better and better mm -hmm. this one I will be it'll be very hard to equal it mm -hmm. to outdo it I don't think so so um, sorry to interrupt uh, yeah, keep going I, I think so this one it was it wasn't hard dealing with him but he also said he had no idea mm -hmm. the details yeah. that, that aren't there in other ones and and I would say the one that the long nose that we did for Doug Champ because all, both of us got to interact with him um, was my most rewarding because he was my parts person oh, right. he yeah. liked to research parts find parts but I know more now about this that I would have done differently on that if I'd known. Mm -hmm. I, I'm very proud of the project. And again, it's my favorite because of the whole picture. But this one has details that uh, the long nose doesn't have, Paul Allen's doesn't mm -hmm. have. Uh, so what are those details? I suppose really we should say, what is White One's story? So how, how does, oh, we're gonna fight over this one. <laughs> how, do, how does she end up here from way well, back 80 years ago she uh i think you if you don't know the history i think she was shot down i want to say january 45 in norway mm -hmm. by a british mustang mm -hmm. um i got to meet the pilot uh at 87 he, he uh, made a trip over here to see his project which looked nothing like this mm -hmm. i forgot what the question was now just the history, the history. oh yeah. the history so uh, there were four, if I remember right, there were four Focke Wolf wrecks in Norway. John Houston in Texas had agreement with the Norwegian government to pull them out if he provided them with a static restoration, mm -hmm. uh, restored restoration for their museum. Yep. So he brought them to Texas. He ended up having, and I don't remember the years, the 1980s. Um, he had a heart attack, passed away. Uh, this, this project was sold to Dr. Timken, became the White One Foundation in Florida. Mm -hmm. And from there, the Collins Foundation bought it, the project from him. 
And the main reason they bought it is the engine has an, an original BMW 801 radial engine. Mm -hmm. Very rare. Um, temperamental. Temperamental, very rare. Uh, we burned a piston on after, after five hours uh, <laughs> trying, to, trying to get a piston. We had to take multiple crashed engines apart to come up with a piston. Oh, wow. So it isn't one that's going to be an everyday flyer. I think it's too rare, too valuable anyway. Uh, and that was eight years ago. Um, it's been, you know, it's been a long, it's been a long road. We uh, build the tooling, like Lindsay says, to do all the research to make sure that we have it right. Mm -hmm. And and I'm sure that there is some detail, maybe details that we missed. Yeah. Because we have. We don't have an original one mm -hmm. sitting here that is all together and that you have access to. Mm -hmm. uh, we have found other ones that have been restored, didn't have accurate detail. You know, didn't have the time, didn't have the yeah. money, probably didn't have the knowledge. Okay, yeah. Uh, with, I found with doing the D13 for Doug, to do this one, there were more parts and information available. Mm -hmm. uh, which is surprising because it, because the interest picked up. Yeah, um, I think as you know, it's a it was a great fighter, multi role. She, it she did everything. Oh yeah. Uh, so this one's an F eight. F eight. And my personal favorite's an A eight. Just to just to say. So I'm I'm happy to be as close as I am to one with an eight in it. Anyways. Well, and what when you say that, what's interesting is that this was flown in the role of an A-8 in mm -hmm. Norway, because the F-8 is obviously ground. Yep. Well, there was no ground war in Norway. No. So her external outboard um, bomb racks armament were pulled out of this airplane, and so she effectively became an F-8 that was used in an A-8 role, which is the best of both yeah. worlds. Oh, yeah. I, I knew I liked it. <laughs> um, Lindsay, you, you, were, you were saying earlier about the level of detail you went to, even with the panels. So where does the research for that come in? Because you're saying you don't have everything. How, how do you know what stencils to put on it and, and things like that, or to either of you, really? So I think um, one of the examples would be of the inside of the fuselage. You can see the stamping mm -hmm. on the skin. And so we can get that stamping from original skins and Another detail to point out would be the reason you can see those is because the inside of the fuselage is not painted. Mm -hmm. It was not painted. So none of them were primed internally? No. Yeah. But in order to protect the skins and the structure, we did do a clear anodize. Mm -hmm. And that's why you can see the stamp. We took the stamp and copied it off of an original German skin and we were able to apply that to the skin of this aircraft, which makes it very authentic. So that making sure the anodizer is, that's where the, the form function comes in, that you want this to last for as long as possible, so you're not going to be accurate to the, the haste to which it was probably originally built. Correct. Yeah. We want to keep her from corroding or having any problems down the road. And in, in a safe condition, again, safety is always. And it was a clear antidote, yeah. so you don't so even you, know what's there. Yeah, yeah, you can't even tell. Yeah. Only because I told you. I know, and that's <laughs> why I'm, 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 I'm stealing your knowledge to make myself sound good. This, this is, this is I, I could keep you guys here the whole time, but let's, let's go over and have a look at the, the P-47 wing, um, and then we can start wandering out towards the larger aircraft that sat outside. It's wonderful. I love it so much. I, when we first went out to Pima last year, that was that was the one I, I wanted to see in, in the shop was the privateer. And when the opportunity to come up here and steal some of your time came up, I was very happy to <laughs> hear it was here. So what's fascinating is the range, the range of aircraft you do. How do you cope with you know? Going from Fokker Wolf, the interesting ways the Germans built aircraft in the 40s, to Republic, 
building them like brick watsits. How do you approach the differences between the two? I drink a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, I think um, uh, when we were at with the, when I was with the Champlin Fighter Museum, we got to restore Japanese George for the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you know, I think it's interesting. You go from American, German, now you're Japanese. Uh, very, even less data for that airplane. Yeah. And I would tell my guys, remember, this was built in 1944. In Japan, you have to think Japanese, 1944. Uh, the Focke Wolf, uh, especially late, later in the war, what were their conditions? They were being bombed. They were, you know, they were losing territory. They were losing their skill. They had to hurry. What would they, what would they do differently? And in 44, 45, they're trying to cut all the, sh do all the shortcuts they can to get the airplane out. Uh, I wouldn't say that I could say the quality was reduced, but you see things that. A misshot rivet. They don't care. Yeah. Uh, being totally perfect on paint, those factories were being bombed. So when you, the, you can say the, the, uh, the mill spec. I can't think the German designate the RLM yeah. standards. That's the standard. But what did they have to paint? Yeah. Whatever was on the shelf. Whatever they put together. The, Which gets us into the whole D-Day stripe conversation. Right. Yeah. How, how perfect do you put a stripe on it? It's, it's that sort of right. argument that's in there. Isn't it? And so what were they doing? They weren't there laying chalk lines. Yeah. It was like, get the darn stripe on and get this thing going. And it was the same with, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the manufacturer over here, they were not being bombed, but they did have to hurry. Yeah. I think the quality details in the American products show that. Mm -hmm. I, I believe because they're not being bombed and we had a huge workforce and in that time we were actually very united mm -hmm. so I, I, I the thing that always fascinates me is you know team, teams like yours being able to move through these different types of aircraft because you look at the structure that's say in the p47 wing I've seen plenty of Spitfire wings which are over-engineered and, <laughs> and all that. And compli yeah, yeah, complicated, yeah, complicated. That's that silly spar and, and things. We can we can complain about Spitfires, the, the clouds come home. But for, for, for you, when you get a new project in or when you discuss doing a project, what are those sort of considerations that you, you, you take in? Because if you've had your guys working on FW-190s for a few years, what do you think about when you think, okay, let's do a P-47? I had kind of wanted to go back to your previous question. Go for and it. you asked about how we go from the 190 to the P-47. And I think it's been interesting for me to see that the guys actually like the variety. Mm. So someone that's been on the Fock Wolf for years, he's excited to get on the P-47 and do something different. Yeah. And... It, they're different challenges um, with the Fock Wolf. The documentation is not as abundant as it is for the P-47. Mm. So it kind of, with the P-47 wing, he's got a little bit more to work with. But he, um, one of the main guys on this, had voiced his excitement for kind of doing something new. Yes. No. That yeah. was before we told him that we were getting ready to do more Fock Wolves. So, so he was desperate then to get on this one, so he'll be busy here while the other ones start. He's also got some variety with turrets, and we had him on the <laughs> privateer yeah. for a little bit. So I think they enjoy the variety. Which is and I think we do too. I, I think the American products easy, somewhat easier because it's all to our standards. You yeah. Know, American rivets, American hardware, uh, the drawings. There's much more doc. You know, you you can find drawings for almost everything manufactured in the U.S. And you don't have to start breaking in imperial metric conversions no. and, and things like that. Or, or translating the darn manuals. The yeah. German manuals. And, and the German fonts as well, which yes. are just in, indecipherable. Um, let's. Let me. Show, there was one thing that I found found really quickly on this that was complicated. You lead the way, Dave. So, 
we 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 got the wing the landing gear was all there the it was all together mm-hmm. it came off the airplane from chino so we had to get it stripped down and get the landing gear out of the airplane out of the wing mm-hmm. i've never seen anything so complicated as a landing gear i think if you collapsed your gear that airplane went back to depot because yeah. it was unbelievable the structure of it is it's built like a tank and I, you know, and it's it's over here. It's just to to get this landing gear out of the airplane, this box has to be removed from the wing. There is no quick removal. Oh right, so the the strut itself is attached into that. So right. it's not a case of just jacking it up pulling, pulling the strut you've got like, to take full structure of the <laughs> yeah like almost all airplanes yes. i mean the the wing to me it's oversimplification but it, the wing is built around this structure <laughs> which i suppose is that sort of strange republic way of building things for strength in lots of places you wouldn't think you needed as much strength as they tended to put right. into things right and yeah. as you know it's, this is a big heavy yeah. fighter yeah. But we, I had no idea that's what it took to to get the gear out. Well, I, I suppose, yeah, I suppose when you've got that massive, great turbocharged engine and things, it's a lot of weight that's going to be going right. through something like that. But well, that's that's nuts. I've, I've never, never seen that or even heard that. You get kind of used to, I spend a lot of time on researching Hawker Typhoons and things, and, and they're sort of brick out houses themselves when the tail stays on. But it's when you start seeing little things like this and wondering, there was clearly a conversation that was had back in, uh, was it 1937 when it was getting right. designed? Yeah, we, yeah. And there was a guy with a drawing board who came up with that, that generations of mechanics cursed, cursed yeah. for, for, the, for the rest of their lives as they're putting these things in. Now, you've got something big and bulky like that, and then you've got the ballerina behind us what again moving to say Fokker Wolf Republic North American what are you seeing when you're working on these aircraft what are the quirks that you start pointing out yeah for 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 something like the P-51 who wants to take that one who wants to complain about the Mustang basically is what I'm saying that that's always good views yeah you're setting us up here yeah totally Uh, you know I think (laughs) You know, the Mustang is, it's like a work of art. Mm. I mean, just everything fits together nicely, or the machining, everything about it is very clean, um, per- precisely built. I yes. don't, I don't, you don't, to me, I don't see the speed. And, mm. and they were, they were turned out quickly, yeah. but it's it just, uh, it's a work of art, you know. Would you want me to say that this is the best fighter of the war? You, that debate will never be decided. But I always actually believe, just because of our own experience, the best overall fighter of the mm-hmm. war, Hawk Wolf 190. I, I knew I liked you, Dad. She she adapted the whole yes. war, and mm-hmm. she did everything. You know, carried torpedoes. One version carried a bomber. But I mean, she started out radio, ended up with a inverted uh, V-line, V-12 engine, 2,050 horsepower, methanol injection, um, supercharged, unbelievable. Um, She just couldn't produce the numbers that the U.S. could produce. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I just had a, did an episode with a friend of mine about the Focke-Wolf Condor, the the FW-200. And it always keeps coming back to Kurt Tank just kind of got it right. You know, the, the designer just he kind of just knew what he was doing and of, of course like any good salesman knew well if we change the engine as well we can sell more of these but <laughs> well and I, I mean and anybody that knows english or german products they like lots of parts mm-hmm. you know yeah. the mustang can be built with a subcomponent could be a hundred parts well the germans would do the same component but they'd use a thousand parts yes I, I, I have an Audi, so I know, yeah. I know that very well every time it yeah. goes in to get fixed. Yeah. <laughs> Lindsay, I'm bringing you back in here. 
you've been smiling. Do you agree with with your father on that one? Because if you know, if, if you could have something in the shop regularly, what would it be? Now that could be taken as which business decision would you like to to keep things going? But just sort of aesthetically, as for you, if if Dave's going Fokker Wolves, well, which he clearly is from the stack of parts we've got behind us, but. <laughs> The way the question was phrased, if I could see something in the shop, not what's the best fighter, what's the mm. best aircraft, but if I could see something in the shop, it kind of goes back to nostalgia for me, and I'd like to do a B-17. Yeah. Um, very proud of my grandpa, very proud of my dad, both of them veterans. My grandpa's on the door up there and uh Keep keeping an eye on you yeah <laughs> he really is i won't tell you what he was telling me with that look <laughs> yeah. um you know goshawk wouldn't be here yeah. i don't believe if it weren't for my grandpa so i would like to be i would like to get a b17 project that would be fun to see and you as you said you've built the hangar specifically for it so be wrong not to i was just gonna say the probably it might it might not be best to say which one is my favorite because i don't want to hurt anybody's feelings but i like you my favorite is sitting outside yeah should we start wandering over that i've got a special connection with that plane well let's go and talk about it well because and and also it also means I get to show off because it's an absolutely beautiful day and we're recording this in February and I know what the weather's like back home. It's about five <laughs> degrees and raining. So that's what, 40, something silly like that. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's gonna be nice to show off what we're doing on the holidays. And also it means we get to make Scott walk backwards to see <laughs> what he's gonna bump into as, well, as we go around. Aren't yeah, blue, just yeah, bump, bump into something just cheap. Don't, just don't hurt anything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, in blue sky days in England, isn't that, a national holiday. Yep, we all get the day off work. It's it's fantastic. It, you know, pe people say, oh, we've had a good summer, and that means we've had two weeks <laughs> where it's been about 19 degrees Celsius and everybody's in shorts and happy and sunburned. But, uh, yeah. So, the Act 9's in. I love, <laughs> I love the Sturman crop duster. That's just unique, I think is the polite way of, of, of putting that one. It, how often do you get something, I say this in the nicest way, but something strange come in the door? I thought about the Clevenger when yeah. you would ask some of the different planes that had come through our shop. I feel like we get the opportunity to do really one of a kind mm -hmm. aircraft, like the Privateer. She's the only one flying in the world. Uh, I believe this is one of the last, if not the last, Stearman crop dusters around, not used as a crop duster, but to In preserve the, the history. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Clevenger, that was... Do you know what the Clevenger I, is? That was going to be my next question. I'll let you tell, but no. that... It, it, the, the Clevenger <laughs> was Larry Rose's uh, airplane, and it was the first production crop duster in this country. Oh, wow. And it is, it is a L5 Stinson mm -hmm. with a, um, a Luscombe lower wing. Mm -hmm. it, you know, at the end of the war, they had all these airplanes, and they uh, turned the L5 into a biplane with a radial engine. Uh, I'm not, it's, and when you say, I, you know, some people go, well, that's ugly. Yeah. Saying it's unique is a very nice yeah. way to put it, <laughs> because... It was the only, it's the only one flying in the world. This is the last flying airworthy um, Stearman crop duster in mm -hmm. the world. Uh, and you gotta, and you have to tell people, now these are crop dusters. This is, this is not a vintage Stearman where everything is perfect. This, this was a working airplane. Tr truly agricultural yes. sort so, of equipment. Yeah. And that's when you ask what airplane, it's, we've had so many unique ones. Um, it's, it's for me just all these years trying to remember spur of the moment and Lindsay remembered a really very good one and Larry Rose was a very he was one of those unique customers mm -hmm. it was, it was uh, 
we were glad to be able to do it. He, he said it was a very strange airplane to fly, mm. but it was the last one, and he yeah. was a retired crop duster. Oh, brilliant. And this owner is a uh, is is uh, retired military, but he's now crop dusting, and he saved this from being, oh. you know, scrapped. Brilliant. Right, let's get outside. You're going to say the Yak-9. Oh, yes, yep. sorry, it's but That's, it, it's a, it's a uh, new built, uh, built in Russia in the uh, 90s. It's owned by Dan Kirkland out of Kingman, Arizona, mm -hmm. who we take care of his T-28 and his T-6. And his 210 when nobody will work on it. But uh, it's got an Allison engine, and it's Russian built. It's not, it's, it's a fa you know, Dan says a very fast airplane, much nicer having the Allison engine um, versus the Russian engine. But the Russian engine was a Klimov. Yep. They're not out there. They're not available. No. You know, they didn't save any. Uh, it is, to me, the line, it's a beautiful looking airplane. And he, he says this is a real hot rod. Yeah. I, I've got a soft spot for those as well. They, it's the old adage, if it looks right, it goes right, doesn't it? Yeah. And there's, there's not a, a waste, Russians didn't tend to waste lines on things that didn't need to be there, and that's... No, and I think they, they don't build airplanes for comfort. No. You know, we, we were, I got to, not because I really wanted to, but I, I worked on the Russian World War II T-34 tank. And oh, right. And drove it. It was miserable working <laughs> on it and driving it. Um, I didn't know how to drive it, which turned out... I wasn't turning the vacuum system on, so I was literally clutching it and breaking it just by manual strength. <laughs> and then a, a young kid said, Dave, you didn't have the vacuum system engaged because everything was in Russian, so yeah. I didn't know no manuals. I was just learning on the run. <laughs> but nobody would drive it except me. And then I found out I didn't know how to operate it. It's funny, she said, the best landing I've ever had in an airplane was in a TU-154. It was so soft. Because it's big, squishy, low-pressure tires and landing on snow in Siberia. That's another story. But yeah, so it's sometimes you get comfort, and they give you vodka before the flight. Yeah, which well, is, and you know we, why? Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah I think you know they 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 build purpose airplanes, yeah. and you build them to land on rough runways, rough mm -hmm. conditions. And, you know, it, it's it was amazing that they produced these airplanes in Siberia in the winter time in sideless hangars. Yeah. It's you nice. have to be extremely tough. And, and it wasn't glamour. Um, Doug Champlin had an original uh, yak. And the paint, they, they came, the Russians came over to put the airplane together when they got done. And they saw the Mustang. And they said, oh, Dave, we're, you know, ours doesn't look near as nice as yours. And I went, yours would go in the Smithsonian because of its accuracy. Yeah. Now, before we go, we have one more thing, which I've stolen from part two, because if you are a licensed aviation engineer in the States and have your A&P ticket, the whole thing, this is a special message for you from Dave and Lindsay. And if I could get your help. Okay. I because would. there is one more thing we need to talk about, don't we? There is. Let's wander back this way, okay. because we can wrap up the what's going on now with... The important question is to continue this, you need a bit of help. We do. We are getting ready to take on more projects and actually a couple more Fock Wolves. <laughs> and right now we are looking for experienced sheet metal people who would like to be part of our crew. So what, what would you look for in those people? Obviously someone who knows what sheet metal work is, which to me, is bashing metal, to put it bluntly. Um, but what would, what would you be looking for in an applicant to, to come out to Gossop? For this particular project, because there's not a lot of documentation on the Falk Wolf, it would be good if someone had experience in working with crash parts. It's a hand-fabricated part, so mm -hmm. we need somebody that has skill or is even trainable yeah. in doing hand forming one of one and two of a kind parts uh, we're not going to go build a hundred focke yeah. so there is no big production assembly line mm -hmm. but so there are a lot of one of one of a kind places you know we have a fuselage uh, 
build fixture, a wing build fixture. We have a lot of tooling that's made these project, these two projects doable, but we need the people that will know how to use the tooling or that are capable of learning how to do it. So it is, it's going to be literally a hand built, two more hand built airplanes. And we don't have an abundance of drawings like you do with other aircraft. Yeah. So we work with pictures. If we have examples, which we do have the example right now in our shop, the F-8, um, wrecked parts, reverse engineer. So ideally going into it that you're not going to have a drawing handed to you and say, make this part. So some, someone with the basic skills, but the ingenuity and the passion to sort of expand that and get really stuck into some of the the, the unique things that you're doing. Yeah, and the passion too, like you said, yeah. I think that's important. And, and like my dad said, uh, we can we can always, if we find the skill, it's we can teach. You don't have to come in and know how to form a part right away. So it's strong strong fundamentals passion to learn more and a passion to be a part of these sorts of projects yeah. super well why wouldn't look why wouldn't you want to come and work here people because yeah i would i cannot thank dave and lindsay goss enough for their time and next week is going to be fantastic getting into that privateer is amazing still all the water bomber bits in it as well and i am a big fan of the consolidated b24 liberator and the pb4y-2 privateer the navy version so stay tuned for that if you want to get these videos and podcasts early please think about joining us as a damn castier it's just three pounds a month over on patreon and we've got our social coming up soon as well so all the details are there if you're not in a position to do that, I completely understand. Please stick some stars into the podcast app of choice. Like and subscribe on the YouTubes. Leave a comment. It's always great. Let us know how we're getting on, what you'd like us to change. And tell your friends if you can, because that is even more powerful than our AI overlords and the algorithms. You always do what your friends tell you, don't you? Anyways, next week we're back up at Goshawk. Until then, thanks for joining us and do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.